Beth, I thank you for the introduction and I want to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, this was really an interesting time for me because uh, when Cordo came out and I saw some announcements, I thought it had a lot of promise and I thought a good way to learn it would be to learn it under fire by writing a book while I was learning it. And and uh, that's what I did and, and it also taught me various ways I could extend Corto. And I would say it turned out to be a very successful experiment and I've been very happy with it. And since then I've rewritten two other books that are much larger, more than 500 pages uh, in Corto. Um, converting from either LaTeX or um, uh, or Markdown, and, and that conversion process was very successful too. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about in our workflow uh, are these areas here, uh, including a little bit about report formatting, um, a little bit about importing data, getting an overview of data, including filtration of observations and missing data patterns and learning about your data and sort of a meta sense. So can we do sort of a, an over or overall or, or a higher order analysis of our data? Um, a little bit about data processing, and this is where the talk actually gets the most controversial because R gives you so many different ways to process data. And what I'm suggesting in this uh, electronic book and in this talk is really a way of living. It's a way of living as a data scientist, statistician, data analyst uh, that is that is very, to me, very logical and very linear way to think. Um, and, and you'll see that those of you who use the tidyverse will see a drastic difference between this approach and, and the tidyverse approach. So that's probably where a lot of the controversy is. Uh, I'll get a little bit into descriptive statistics and analysis. Um, analysis I won't really cover very much. That's so project specific, but I will talk about some principles. And a key principle is staying close to the data. Um, and one of the uh, ways we translate that phrase is that we never dichotomize ordinal or, cat or continuous variables when we're analyzing data. So that's that's the data analysis sin that we want to avoid, which mainly means that tables are no longer viable as a tool in statistics unless all of your variables are already categorical, um, uh, especially your, your uh, baseline or independent variables. So there's controversy there. And then there's chapters each on caching, parallel computing and simulation. I won't really cover any of that. Uh, those things are more standalone topics. Um, so if you look at the preface to this ebook, there's there's a lot of motivation and uh, a lot about what I'm trying to accomplish. And then there's um, resources for learning Corto and some other details. And then there is a um, chapter two, which is a very detailed case study. You see this that comes up here. This is um, Mermaid. So you can you can use this book as a template for um, for Corto because if you click on that code button, you can see the source and you see how easy it is to specify little relationships. And in Corto, uh, these are rendered instantly because Mermaid is pre-installed with Corto, uh, and so you you immediately get these very simple sort of flow diagrams. So this case study illustrates. Um, a lot of the things that are in the book and a lot of the philosophy of preparing data for analysis and analyzing data. And I would encourage you to go through this case study first uh, before really looking at the individual chapters. But what I'm going to be doing is going through things in individual chapters. I'm not going to cover any of the R basics, but this is uh, one way to help people learn R who are not already very exposed to R. Um, so let's get into the report formatting. Uh, and so there are many aspects to formatting, including how do you lay out figures. And Cordo has some really wonderful capabilities, um, as we saw earlier in the conference. Um, you can also make customized HTML tables to make tables as advanced as you want. And then um, there's ways to place things. So do you want to place things in marginal notes? Do you want to place them in tabs? Do you want to expand or hide material? 
uh, I have this uh, GitHub repository with a, a file called uh, rep tools for reporting tools. And these are helper functions that were written largely uh, to extend what Cordo can do, such as uh, making dynamic tabs and dynamic marginal content. And I'll show you a little bit about how those are used. Then you have decisions to make about your overall format. I didn't list Microsoft Word because I use that as seldom as I humanly possibly can, uh, but uh, Cordo has really great support for Microsoft Word. And then uh, there is a section in here about how to do multi-format reports because some of your content needs to be dynamic. For example, when you're producing PDF, you can't have an interactive graphic. So it, it needs to be, let's say if you were using ggplot2, you need to produce PDF, but if you're producing HTML, it can be interactive, so you can use Plotly. And so you might have code in your report that is sensitive to what the format currently being produced is and, and use different graphics calls, whether it's PDF versus HTML. A big theme is metadata or data dictionary. Uh, and so this involves at the simplest level, variable labels and units. And there is a section in the book about making, making the claim that you really don't want to have highly descriptive variable names because that means the variable names are so long that they're unwieldy and your code is actually much harder to read. But you really want to have fully descriptive variable labels and then those labels are attached to the names in a variety of ways and can be dynamically looked up and popped up in our studio windows. Uh, and I go into that in some detail. So I use the variable labels for the full description. Uh, I also make heavy use of units of measurement for better annotating plots and tables. Um, so that is about annotation of reports. Um, and then there's um, other material in this chapter that goes into detail about tables and multi output format, but the next thing I want to cover is analysis file creation. So we typically import things like binary files, could be a SAS data set or Stata, or we import CSV, uh, or we have an API that goes directly into a system such as REDCap, and we may want to import uh, 50 files at one time in a loop, and I give examples of how to do that very, very easily. So when we're importing, we want to have variable, uh, we want to have manageable variable names, and we want to add data dictionary content or metadata. And so we can import labels. Uh, we can have external metadata that's in another place that is then associated with your primary data uh, to define labels and units and comments about variables. And then we need ways to view data dictionaries. So the book tells you how to easily call a function that will pop up a data dictionary into the RStudio view window. So you can use that data dictionary as a guide to help you remember variable names uh, and help you formulate your analysis code. So um, there is a section about importing, and I just want to mention that, um, say this is, this is one way you can import a data set that doesn't have any uh, metadata with it and you can associate the metadata on the fly uh, very easily using this old function in the HMIS package called updata. So you can see that we're starting with the data set D and we're renaming various variables. And the dot Q function is just a, a quoting function in the HMIS package, so you don't have to use as many quote marks. Then we define a little function YN because we have a whole list of yes, no variables that are coded exactly the same way and we wanted to put them as factor variables with levels yes or no. So we're just transforming those as updata is building your new data set. We're defining uh, levels of a variable. We're dropping variables. We're defining labels. And then uh, we're defining units of measurement. So this would be what you might do when you're, you don't have any external metadata and you don't have any uh, metadata coming directly from your data system. So we'll see in a minute when you're when you're importing from REDCap, you'll have metadata. You won't be doing this like this, except for units of measurement. So REDCap used to fully support units of measurement, and Paul Harris took that out a number of years ago, and I've been lobbying him ever since to put it back in because I think units of measurement are really fundamentally 
important um, attributes for continuous variables. So there's separate sections in here to how to deal with various kinds of input data, whether it's binary, like Stata, SPSS, SAS, Excel, reading multiple files. Uh, and for REDCap, I'll just mention, this is for people who were not using one of the at least two R packages for reading directly with a REDCap API. This is using uh, this import, .redcap, import REDCap function in the, um, in our GitHub repository. So when I say import red cap parenthesis parenthesis, that will read in the last the last exported um, file into your directory from your directory, and it will read the R code and it will read the uh, CSV file, and it will clean that up. So you know, R, uh, R, uh, red cap makes two copies of all your variables if they're categorical. We don't really want two copies of variables, and we don't want the word factor to be part of a variable name. So this cleans up a lot of things and creates a very streamlined uh, data frame with all the metadata that we can get out of REDCap when you're not going directly through the API. So it's very simple to get very streamlined, ready to analyze REDCap files just using the standard R export into CSV and to dot, dot .R files. Um, so that's all I'm going to cover from the analysis one. The missing data section, you know, we all have to deal with missing data, and there's a lot of ways you can understand your data. Uh, we can look at the extent of missing data per variable or per observation. Those are both very important. We can look at patterns. So how does a missingness cluster, how if you were sequentially excluding variables, uh, so which, which variable is missing the most? And then if you were excluding on the basis of missing on other variables, how many exclusions would you get? And then there's interesting patterns you can look at, such as the association between values of non-missing variables and the number of variables missing per observation. So this is actually a statistical analysis that's automatically done uh, where you uh, run an ordinal logistic regression to understand the strong predictors of the number of missing missing variables an observation has and whether it, you have more missing data for the sicker patients or for the less sick patients or whatever. So that gives us a statistical analysis of missing missed patterns. And so there's this um, rep tools uh, function that defines a lot of other functions. Uh, we're importing a uh, data set from our data set repository that's fully annotated, the support data set, converting it to a data table and we're running the mischeck function on that, saying that we do want to predict the number of missing per observations. There's a variable we want to omit while we're doing that that's really kind of redundant. So you see the number of missings per variable and per observation, the, the, uh, the minimum, maximum, and mean number. Uh, so uh, out of 1,000 patients, we tend to have 141 uh, people missing uh, on a variable. And we have the whole distribution of number of missings per variable or per observation. And then the uh, miss uh, check uh, function creates all these tabs for you automatically. It gives you sort of packaged analyses. So the number of uh, missing values per observation is a dot chart. Uh, that was per variable, sorry. The number of missing variables per observation is a different dot chart. Uh, this one has is, is been handy for me, the mean number of other variables that are missing when the indicated variable is missing. So when serum creatinine is missing, that bottom dot there, on the average, nine other variables are missing on the same patient. So it's just one of many ways to understand uh, the missingness patterns. You can look at sequential exclusions. ADLP has the highest number of missings, but you have additional patients that are missing on other variables. We can look at combinations, all possible combinations of missingness, whoops, um, using this kind of dot chart. And if you hover over things, you, you get a lot more information uh, about these combinations. So you can hover, uh, this, this is using Plotly uh, type of graphics. You can see marginal counts, you can see combination counts and more information at the top. So those are all possible combinations of missingness. 
And this is where a model is run to predict the number of missing variables on the basis of the values of the non-missing variables, the variables that are never missing. So you can see the time until death has the strongest ability to predict the number of missing uh, values. So it turns out uh, people that die quicker have more missing data at baseline because a lot of them are, are on a ventilator and they're unable to be interviewed to get certain uh, data points. So that just gives you a lot of different ways uh, here in these tabs to explore missing data. And then uh, data checking, um, we'd like to do range checks and cross variable consistency and like to do this with minimum coding and get listings and summaries. So if you look at the way most people do this, it, it takes a lot of coding and you can really capitalize on R to do this with a lot less coding because you can create expressions for your checks. So these are conditions that should not happen very often. So in this data set, someone who's younger than 30 years old or older than 90, uh, it should not occur very often in the data. Somebody who has, who's female and has a maximum heart rate above 170, I just made this up. I don't know if that occurs often or not, but it's just an example of a consistency. Uh, base ejection fraction is between 72 and 77 or is greater than 77. You just have this whole array of expressions and then you pass that to data check and it will execute that array uh, passing through the observations. And we can tell it to also uh, give me a report by ID. And so you get a separate tab for each check with the list of observations that met the criteria. See, that was age less than 30, age greater than 90. Um, so you see that here's one for combinations and you can also get your summary by ID and site with the check that was triggered, the values of the variables that led, led it to trigger that as a positive check. And you can also get a summary, uh, which is giving you counts of how often certain triggers were, were met. So those are all just automatically produced by virtue of having data check create tabs uh, that that Cordo knows about. So that's data checking and then data overview. Um, we want to look at observation filtering. So we need to create diagrams where we insert uh, computed counts that we're making. And we can do that many different ways, but two ways are with consort diagrams and with the general purpose mermaid. Uh, and then we also want to get more data about the data. So we have various missing value snapshots. Um, some of those were presented just a few minutes ago and we can have data characteristics. Uh, and, and hopefully that'll make sense in a minute when I show you an example. So that includes um, breaking variables down into discrete versus continuous variables. How many ties are there in the data? How much information is in the data? This is something you're probably not used to seeing, but we have an information measure that goes from zero to one. So a variable that would have near zero information would be a binary variable where almost every observation is a zero. So that would be a very low information content where a high content variable would be a continuous variable where there's no ties in the data. Uh, measures of symmetry of the distribution, rare values, and common values. And so for filtering of observations, we can, um, here's an example of using a data table to create uh, a clinical trial where as different criteria are met, people are randomized and then they're randomized to uh, treatment A or B. Um, and then that's our simulated clinical trial data. Um, and then we're going to, um, set up the counts uh, that we're going to need that are passed to the consort package uh, using the consort plot function and giving it the labels for the various branches or nodes uh, and certain other information, we'll get a classical consort diagram and you have these options of putting in sort of uh, large categories uh, to organize your chart. But that's just a standard, uh, standard consort diagram. And um, you can actually 
more naturally make a consort diagram if you use the building blocks instead of using the actual consort plot you use all these building blocks that the consort package comes with like adding box adding a side box and i just found this a little more intuitive to calculate things myself and pass them to these building blocks and I, i'll get the same output but just the inputs are much different and then with mermaid you can make all sorts of plots but mermaid is going to construct the plot the way it wants to so it won't meet your actual uh, consort rules. But one of the things that's, that makes this pretty general is you see when I define the mermaid uh, markup here, it's all in quotes. It's all under this object X. And so this is, um, this is brace brace is a macro. So this is using the knit expand function in the knitter uh, package we can pass macros. Uh, so it's, it's just like passing R variables. And by having uh, brace, brace, the variable values are inserted at that point in the chart. So this is just a very general way to associate variable content uh, with nodes or parts of nodes because it's parts of the node labels. So if you use this little make mermaid function that I wrote, this is where you define all those variables that are referred to by by these symbols up here so like this one and that's just a count of how many people were on treatment b and they had the response variable measured whereas this uh, is a count of people on treatment b whether or not they had the response variable uh, already assessed so when you pass that through make mermaid it will uh, create the mermaid diagram so this allows you a lot more flexibility than what you can do with a consort diagram but it doesn't doesn't meet the classical formatting uh, criteria, but I think it's still useful for a lot of things. You can also um, have um, uh, nodes that are more dynamic and, and they will have more um, uh, pop-up content. So this is done with a callback where I have uh, a table that pops up when I, when I click on a certain area. This is one, one one of the few problems I've had with Cordo, it's a little bit buggy and things like this. So this is supposed to work that you're supposed to hover and see a pop-up table, but I found it's really browser dependent. So that's not quite there yet, but I, I've had it work with some browsers, but not with the, uh, the main browsers that I use. So that's supposed to be a, a live link. You can also have URLs and link to things by clicking within the nodes of the mermaid chart. Descriptive statistics is a very wide area and um, we need to really respect the nature of the data. And so we have various uh, tools that I use over and over for descriptive statistics. The primary one being the describe function, which is a very old function in the HMIS package um, for univariate summaries. And so this will give you statistical summaries and also give you graphical summaries and for continuous variables, it gives you these little spike histograms, which are nearly full resolution uh, displays of your distribution. You'll see examples of that in a minute. Of course, for categorical variables, we just have frequency tables and frequency dot charts. And for continuous variables, we also, uh, besides spike histograms, we use extended box plots. And then for longitudinal data, there's special uh, displays that you need that I really won't be covering now. And there's also special displays you have for multiple category event charts and timelines and various displays for showing relationships such as variable clustering. So let's just look at a couple of examples very quickly. Um, this is uh, reading this stress echo data set and I've made it so that Cordo hides that output by default and I click and I can expand it. So I see statistics that are appropriate to each type of variable and you see it has different font for the label compared to the variable name and a different font for the units of measurement. Uh, so you see quantiles, Gini's mean difference, which is better than the standard deviation for measuring dispersion, the mean, the information uh, quotient, how many distinct values there are, and then you have what's the most important output is, is the raw data distribution with high resolution. So either one or 200 bars 
you can see uh, extreme skewness. You can ex you can see extreme digit preference here in in uh, blood pressure, and and you can s you, you won't see digit preference when you make regular plots that most people use, such as broad bars or CDFs. You won't see it in a CDF very well, but you can see bimodality, digit preference, and all kinds of things when you when you show the data at high resolution and you can see it doesn't take much space in your report to be able to do that this is just capitalizing on html output which can contain little little widgets little um little graphs that are converted to um, base 64 encoding for use in standard uh, self-contained html so that's what the describe function looks like and you see that for for binary variables uh, and so on. And then there's ways to pop up various things in Windows to help you view the output, which is a guide when you really get to the analysis. And then here's an example where we use the make tabs function in the rep tools uh, repository where we're plotting something that produces two plots. It produces one plot that's labeled categorical variables and one plot that's labeled continuous. So you can see the, the continuous variables are just proportions in each category. And you see, this is a variable that has two categories. Here's one that has three categories and you have these three proportions here for history of cigarette smoking. Um, and then when you have continuous variables, you'll see the spike histograms. Now that gets more interesting when you say, let's make these plotly graphics uh, and we're gonna make tabs like we did before and make these dynamic tabs. So now when you hover over something, you see a lot more information. You see the statistics that were in the table that the describe function created. Um, and, and these are the categorical variables and you see always the numerator and denominator. So there's never any question about what these fractions represent. If there was missing data, these, these dots would be color coded by the amount of missing data. And then for continuous variables, you see what we saw before, but you can see the individual bars. So this is a systolic blood pressure, 138. These were binned to the nearest two millimeters of mercury. There were eight patients at the 138 bin. But then importantly, when you go over here, you see all of the detailed uh, distributional characteristics and number of uh, missing values uh, and uh, quantiles and so on. So that's just the Plotly version, which works in any HTML report, and it gives you this hover ability to look up much more information. Um, there's a lot more ways to get um, summary data, and the summary M function is for summarizing multiple variables. So I give a formula like this that has lots of dependent variables, and I'm making history of myocardial infarction an independent variable. Um, so this is going to be my stratification variable and the rest of these are analyzed separately by levels of history of MI. So that formula is passed here and we're going to use make tabs where you can say the first tab is going to be empty. So if you look down here, you see a blank tab. That just means that by default, nothing's going to show. So nothing will show to you click on one of the tabs. The first tab is called table one which is the HTML version of the summary M function. So let's see what that looks like. When you show this on a wider screen, all of this formatting is automatically adjusted to be very beautiful, like you're used to seeing in a table and it's using different fonts and, um, and so on. So that is the HTML version of the summary M. And if we want to look at a categorical variable plot, we see something like this. If we want to look at continuous variable plots, we see extended box plots. So if you hover, you'll see the definition of what the corners represent. So this corner represents the 95th percentile. And here's the fifth percentile down here, which is 104. And you have the mean and you have the, the median the interval that contains 25%, 50%, 75% of the data. So that's that's how you look up what the points in the extended box plot means. That's a lot more information than a regular box plot. You can also do semi-interactive spike histograms 
that have the same information on them as a box plot. And with Plotly, you can turn certain things off. If you decide you don't want to currently display that, you just click in the legend and that will uh, take something away and you can click and put it back in. So that is um, a whirlwind tour of various descriptive statistics that I use as standard. And data manipulation and aggregation is where we tend to spend more of our time. And here is where data table is really the central component. So the, the biggest take home message of this talk is if you haven't already learned data table, you need to start today because it's probably by far the most important add on package in all of R. Uh, it gives you a logical way to, to work. It is super logical, it is coherent, it is consistent, and it's blazing fast. So it has, it has nothing but pluses, but you do have to learn it. And I, I think one of the things we face as data scientists, there are people that want to get up and running as a data scientist without mastering, the, mastering their trade. So if you don't really master the base of R, you know, the base R methods and code, um, and to me, if you don't master data table, you're really not mastering your trade. Uh, and so it's, it, data table is not the fastest thing you'll ever learn, but every, every hour that you invest in learning will pay off with multiple hours of personal efficiency. So uh, using data table and using base R, we can do subsetting, we can modify variables, we can do various recodes and reshapes. So this chapter goes through this, and this is the schematic that really explains data table in a nutshell. You have a data table, which looks a lot like a data frame, it's rectangular. You have something that tells you what rows you're operating on, what, what to do and what columns you're operating on, and by grouping, uh, you can also have an on operator here when you're matching on certain variables that might have different names and different, um, different things. And then we can have lots of extra arguments. So this chart goes into a little more detail to help you with that. When you type the name of a data table and a bracket, that means you're entering into the environment of that data table and everything you do is within that, um, within in that uh, environment. And so you enter the environment, you're dealing with rows, columns and by or on. So the rows are the rows to fetch or to change. Uh, you have the columns to fetch or the columns that you're creating or redefining and creation of new columns and redefining will be done with a colon equals. And then you can have by for grouping or on for matching. And then when you get out of that environment, you have to figure out what are you left with. So when you leave that environment by closing it with the bracket, if you didn't have a colon equal, you might just have printed or plotted the output. Um, and uh, you might have assigned the result to a new data table. If you had a colon equal, that means you're changing the data table in place. And if you have a very large data table, to be able to add a new column in place is a major time savings. So you can add and modify columns, leaving the original name, uh, original data table in place. So that's really the setup for data table. And then what I did in writing this book is I had a bunch of notes dating back uh, 10 and 20 years uh, of, of how to do common tasks. So I had all these code snippets lying around and I decided they weren't useful to me or anyone else unless I organized them. So I brought all these code snippets in from a variety of little files and annotated them. And I tried to write down what are the tasks that we need to do all the time, uh, such as finding observations in November, um, finding uh, all the observations from a month that's like MB, in other words, that's MB in the name of the month, um, combination criteria, pulling off one variable, pulling off two variables out of a data table. Um, these are just things that we do all the time and just try to show prototype, prototypical examples of those. Um, and so you'll see a lot of examples here. This one just, um, is translating an existing variable to make it uppercase. Um, 
how do you analyze selected variables and subsets? But really, I want to get to the recoding because that's where we that's where we tend to uh, spend a little bit more of our time. Oh, before that, this is just how you change variable names using um, data table, or you can use the dot Q function just to keep from quoting so many things. Um, so renaming variables is very easy, and we can rename variables by matching pieces of strings, and that's just very, very easy to do. Um, but when we get into uh, recoding, you have so many options, and uh, one of the most powerful and logical ways is with the F case function in data table. And so uh, it's going to recode according to the first condition that's met. So if the patient died, if this is true, our result for this X variable is gonna be quote death. If X2 was uh, either stroke or MI quoted, we'll call that a stroke slash MI will be the category to assign. If the patient was not one of these, but was symptomatic is this, otherwise we default to none. So uh, F case is just one of many, many ways to recode. Um, and it's, it's a very logical and powerful way to do it. Sometimes your recoding is just a simple table lookup and you don't need data table or anything else for that. You can just use named vectors. So we can pull in state, using state abbreviations, we can look up the state name. And then there's an example here for uh, hierarchical recoding. So we wanna recode things where we have plants and animals, and within plants, we have vegetables and fruit. Within animals, we have domestic and wild. So we have a hierarchical tree and we can navigate that tree to do very various recodes. And without going into the detail that this will show you uh, how to do that. So recoding is a big topic. Um, operating on multiple data tables is a little more advanced topic, but there's a lot of capabilities there that you can look at later. Then we get into summary statistics. Uh, we can summarize all the variables. We can summarize subsets. We can summarize uh, using functions that return multidimensional results. We can do marginal summaries. And data table really shines for this. And there's a new package that works well with data table and other systems, which I think I think is called uh, Collapse. And I need I'll be adding that to this chapter because that is a very general way to compute summary statistics and it's ultra fast for huge data sets. But what's built into data table is pretty amazing. And one of the things that's tricky for people to learn, but once you learn it, .sd stands for the whole data table. So you can do operations on all the variables, each variable separately. The operation we're doing here is to run the nd function, which is the number of distinct values for, all the, for, the, for a variable. So we're saying to run, run the ND function separately for every variable in data table D, and we just get a count of the unique values that way. We can say, do it for the variables that match these patterns, the variables that have HX in their name, or they have either D or M. So that's an OR symbol there, either D or M in their name. So we're, we're saying this is just the variables that match this, uh, these criteria here. And we're running that uh, analysis just on two variables. This is creating a function to calculate the mean, ignoring missing data. And we're going to run that on every uh, variable in the data set that is numeric. So it's very easy to put conditions when you're running on a lot of variables. Uh, let's look at this one here. We're defining a function cmult which is that the, um, the, the variable is not numeric and it has more than two distinct values. So that's a true false function. And we're gonna just run that function um, uh, here to see which variables qualify for the analysis. So that's like saying is dot numeric, but it's more general to meet these criteria. And then we're gonna do a, a table and we're going to summarize each variable with a very brief frequency table, hoping it doesn't have too many levels for us. Uh, and that's the output that you get. Um, just more examples of, 
of creating functions. And I, I want to make a major point here. This won't seem like much of a point, but when you write a little function like this and you get that function debugged, you can use that function in the more complex context, but debugging it here uh, means you can understand it and make sure it absolutely works on one variable. So you only have to debug it on one variable to make sure it's right. And then you're using that same function for multiple variables. So you'll see that philosophy pay off in many different ways uh, with this approach. And I'll show you a more advanced example of that shortly. So uh, we're just subsetting data and doing lots of different op observation, uh, operations. And then when you're using the data table function, you also have access to uh, multi-way summarization. So the cube function will, uh, when we're saying by gender, or let's say by gender and the history of uh, myocardial infarction, we're gonna, we're gonna summarize the mean basal heart rate with the mean, we're gonna summarize heart rate with the mean and with the number of non-missing observations. So we define these little functions up here, and then we run it by gender and history combinations but we're doing it with cube and not with a regular data, data table operation, because when you're doing it with cube, you'll get it for all possible combinations like you expect, but then you get all the marginal summaries. So here's a summary by gender, ignoring history, summary by history, ignoring gender, and the summary ignoring both, which is your overall grand summary. And then if you wanna have more control over that, you can use the grouping sets function in data table um, and you can tell it uh, restrictions on how you want to use cross classifications when you're summarizing the data. So that was um, summary statistics and uh, merging data. I'm just going to show um, this. This is a front end to both the regular merge and the data table merge. Uh, merge with a capital M, it helps you merge lots of data sets at one time, but more than that, it gives you a report on how the merge went. First of all, how do you do merging in base data table? It's very, very easy and very, very fast. Uh, if you want to use this front end capital M merge, I'm merging baseline with longitudinal data, merging on ID, and you see I get a report if I don't say print equals false here. I get a report. So in the baseline data set, there were two variables, four observations. There were four unique IDs. Um, in the longitudinal data, there were three variables, 12 observations, four unique IDs. And uh, only three of that those IDs were in the baseline table. In the merge table, there were four variables total, 13 observations, five unique IDs, and four of the IDs that are in the final table are uh, were in the baseline table. And then you also have this information that's reported. So this is just a, to help you feel good uh, that, the t that the merging went well. Now, longitudinal data is a huge topic I'm not going to cover very much of, but we have various needs for processing longitudinal data and data table is just exceptionally uh, powerful for processing longitudinal data. And, and so you can deal with longitudinal data of various types and you can convert, you can convert between various types. And um, so you might have a uniform number of rows and you might want to do something like last observation carried forward, which we usually frown upon as statisticians, uh, but there are built-in functions in a fill and set in a fill and data table that make it real easy to do that. But in other cases, we have variable number of rows and you might want to carry forward. And carry forward in that context means you need to create new observations that didn't exist before. So you're going to expand the number of observations. And this just shows you how to create observations past the last observation out to the maximum possible day you're creating these new observations and you're combining those with an R bind onto your original data set. Um, but this is where uh, data table shines even more 
So you want to say, uh, what is the first day in which y was greater than, or equal, greater than or equal to three? So what is the minimum day such that y is greater than or equal to three? We're gonna call that first three. What's the first day in which y is greater than or equal to seven? We're gonna do that separately by patient. Uh, so this is what happens when it never did pass the threshold of seven, puts in an infinite, which we can go to a little trouble to make that be an, an NA instead of an infinite. But where this philosophy really shines is when you have more complex conditions. So if you wanted the days to be consecutive, you can say um, that, let's say we needed uh, Z to be greater than 0.5 and the Z on the previous day to also be greater than 0.5. We're gonna do that separately by patient. So that's just an and condition with a lag of your measurement, but that's not still the most general way to think about it. Uh, the most powerful and general way to think about it is to write a function that counts. So even though you might be interested in the second day in which something happened, let's count how many days in which it happened, like how many days in a row was something satisfied. So this function will do that uh, very, very concisely. So when something happens in a row, so this will give you a count of two, but then the count starts over and this would be a count of one and a count of two there. Then it starts over and this is a count of four. So this will calculate the number of consecutive uh, true values. And so when you're doing your table, data table operation, you can say, give me the first day. Uh, so this would be the first day, the minimum day for which the number of consecutive occurrences of Z greater than 0.5 is equal to two. So once you write this function and get it to work for one patient uh, and get it debug, now you're using it separately for all the patients. And instead of just writing a condition that says Z is greater than 0.5 and the previous was also greater than 0.5, let's use it as a counter because we might want to have three days in a row and we just change that to a three. So this means the second consecutive day was Z greater than 0.5. Um, and so once you learn how to write counter functions and you learn how to debug a function for one patient, which is much easier than debugging it for the whole data set, you see you just plug those functions in uh, and use those in the data table context. When you're doing uh, overlap joins, you can get a lot more complicated and data table is extremely powerful for doing that. So without going into details, what, what we're trying to do here is uh, we have an events data set with zero or more rows per subject containing start and end times and a measurement X representing a daily dose of something giving you the patient between S and E start and end times. You have a base data set B that has one record per subject with times C and D and you want to compute the total dose of the drug received between C and D for the subject. You do that by finding all records in E for the subject such as the interval C and D has any overlap with the interval S to E. And for each one, you compute the number of days in the interval S to E that are also in C to D. So, you know, it sounds pretty form formidable, but once you get your data set set up, uh, we run the F overlaps function in data table and we calculate, uh, we, we do this by, uh, for the, the left-hand side of the, the, the left-hand data table, we do it by ID low and high. And for the right-hand one by ID start and end, type equals any. And now this calculates the elapsed uh, time for the right overlap intervals and the total dose over that correct elapsed time. So this sounds like a pretty complex thing. And this code is not the easiest code to read, but you can see that the once you get a, a hang of it, the amount of programming is, is pretty minimal. So um, lots more about manipulating longitudinal data. And then graphics is a very general chapter with some graphics principles mainly. 
and in a few few tricks about using uh, ggplot2, which I I use very very heavily, uh, and I also use Plotly a lot. And then the analysis chapter is really showing you how to um, really do better than table one by staying close to the data. And I'll just sort of stop with uh, showing you an example of, of a, what I think is a pretty rich presentation that's a lot better than table one would be this presentation. So this is using ggplot2. Instead of showing the age distribution in treatment A and treatment B, it's a randomized trial. We don't need to know the age distribution by treatment because it was randomized, it's irrelevant. Uh, what we need to know is how does age relate to the outcome of the trial? So the relationship between age and the probability of dying in the hospital is given by this non-parametric estimate. And then using this add GG layers function, we can uh, add easily extended box plot and spike histogram to the ggplot2 standard output. So now we have the univariate distribution of age, which would be the combined treatment A and B distribution of age uh, or the raw data for age. Instead of stratifying this by treatment and giving people confusing data, we give them the overall trial patient characteristics um, uh, in our chart, which is augmenting the relationship with the outcome, which is data that table one doesn't try to show usually, but it's a lot more valuable data than table one. And this uses a little function called melt data, which is just a way to say you have one dependent variable, lots of independent variables, and you're going to reshape that into a tall and thin data set that's ready to pass directly into ggplot so that you're faceting on the variable so you get separate analysis for each variable with a free x scale as you go across variables. They don't need to have the same x range. So um, sort of to conclude things, um, I think data table is one of our most important tools by far. I think you've seen how you can put things together with Quarto. And what I really didn't show you is how um, in some of these chapters, I produce marginal graphics uh, with some uh, functions that make it really easy to put things in the margin. Cordo has all these beautiful formatting capabilities and Cordo, like data table, gives you a unified way to think about reporting, uh, whether you're making a web page, a book, a report, or a slide presentation, Cordo can do all of that without learning new R packages. Um, so I'll stop there and see if I've stimulated any uh, any comments from anyone? Thanks for listening. Thanks, Frank, for um, it's always an interesting presentation. Lots of uh, chatter on uh, the the uh, different things with data tables. So one of the questions is that. <clears throat> When will we move beyond static paper and PDFs for research manuscripts and FDA submissions? Any That's thoughts? a wonderful um, question. I think I think those are FDA submissions are probably going to move faster than journals. I can't really speak for FDA, even though I work for FDA now. Um, I think FDA will eventually have more flexibility because it helps their reviewers review easier. You can do a global search um, within an HTML report and you can drill down to see details. I think journals are hopeless and are not going to change. And the best way to deal with journals is to quit submitting papers to journals and just take take things under your own control. So um, so when you're when you're able to self-publish or put something in a preprint archive or write a blog article, you have total control and you can use the latest and greatest interactive graphics. And another question is, do you have a catchy name for your replacement for table one? I need a catchy name or it's not gonna catch on. Um, I, um, I would be open to suggestions, but uh, the, the purpose of the replacement to table one is to show things that are not uh, preordained. 
you know, we, we look at comparison of treatment A and B, it's really irrelevant in a randomized trial, especially one that has more than 30 or 40 patients in it. Mm -hmm. um, but what we don't get is just, you know, who's in the trial and then what happened to them? And was it, if death is your outcome, was that mainly in those over 70 or did the deaths get spread across all the ages? That's the information people are not giving that that is absolutely interesting and sometimes unexpected. So, so Peter suggested baseline outcome plot, BOP. Yeah, and it, it needs to connote um, its baseline distribution because it's study, it's study population description, right. but also outcome, outcome relationships. So some combination. Yeah. Um, and then Peter says that, you know, he agrees on public uh, publishing, but it's uh, easy for him since he's a senior, but hard for trainees, mentees who are trying to build up their reputation and get tenure. You know, any thoughts on how to do this without hurting a generation of junior people? That, that's really probably the trickiest of all the questions. And I think promotion and tenure committees are doing a major disservice now by promoting the wrong people. They're not promoting people whose research is reproducible. They're just reporting, promoting people that have high volume output or have splashy, uh, splashy results. Um, but I think um, the, the tenure and promotion process needs to be totally redone. But there was an announcement this week from NIH that's gonna have a lot of ramifications which is NIH is really changing uh, how they want reporting to be done and they want it to be much faster and not wait on journals. They want the results more usable quicker. So I think the step that NIH took this week, which I need to read more about, may, may get us going. Yeah, I mean, so many institutions use easy metrics to, to count you know, publications and things like that for for reviews or for um, promotions and things like that. And it's yeah. not necessarily quality. Right. Um, so have you um, considered using the code link true in this Quarto YAML setting. It's hard that's to know. My next, yeah. That's my next thing to do because, and the only reason I haven't used CodeLink already, I think it has a dependency that I didn't have installed. So uh, I need to look at that one more time. But I think uh, for those of you who don't know CodeLink, it will, uh, when, you, when you have a function call in your code that's listed in your report, you can click on the name of the function that will put up the documentation uh, for that function. I think that's what code link does. And okay. I think that's pretty cool. So that's on my to-do list. That's now on my to-do list as well. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause it, sometimes it's hard to know what's coming from HMISC or data table or, you know, where are things coming from? So that, that might help with some of that. And I've also really appreciated the having being able to collapse code so that you know I can insert a figure but not disrupt the flow of the diagram. So people can see the code of how things were created, but not necessarily all the details if they don't want to. That, right. And and I, I also let me show you just one thing in this analysis chapter. Um, there are certain analyses that you do where you want some supplemental information. Right. And so I say, I see here PR equals margin. These are some denominators that define how the smoothing was done. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll appear in a marginal table. So sometimes you put things outside the body that are supplemental information that don't get in the way of the body of the report. And then other times you'll, you'll use a command or just hard coded in Quarto to have an optional section that's a, a show or hide, a hide or you know collapse collapsible section 
to have more information. And I think those are very valuable for reports too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I like the the use of having the the um, figure legends in the margins. I think it makes. I really like that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, from Travis Gerke, I, I don't know why we would want to analyze baseline variable relationships with um, outcomes in trials that aren't designed to evaluate those relationships get misleading results, for example, if there's an interaction with treatment assignment. So I, I never want to criticize doing an analysis because something more complex might be in play, because if you don't try to analyze it, you'll never learn anything about that interaction. Mm -hmm. So the, the presentations that we do in all clinical trial reports now do nothing but hide interactions. So I can't really agree with the premise of that question. But I think most trials are actually designed to do exactly what I'm suggesting. They usually have some kind of age distribution and they usually have a severity of disease at baseline. And the, the study report doesn't even tell us whether those patients with minimal severity of disease ever had any of our endpoints. So by showing the relationships between severity of disease and the outcome, we're giving new information. So I think most clinical trials have have the information you need to create these relationships. And it. so the question I'm always left with in a clinical trial is what happened to the patients and which patients did it happen to? And this is an attempt to solve that. Right. Um, any other last questions for Frank? Well, again, thank you very much for this presentation, and we will take a um, quick break until 26 after the hour, um, coming back with Peter and talking about wrangling medical data. Thanks for having me, and thanks for the great comments and, and discussion. Yeah, it's generally, definitely generated lots of chat, so. Great, I have to go back and look at some more of it. Yeah. <laughs>